we can get started. Um, so I hope everybody is um, having a good evening so far. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Hudson River Museum. Uh, I, my name is Sarah Linda Licklow and I am Director of Education at the museum and I am joined this evening uh, by our guest, the artist Raul de Nieves and uh, who will be in conversation with Jose Guerra Lopez and uh, my colleague, Olivia Cipriano. So Olivia, are we ready to, uh, to begin? I think we've, we've emptied out that waiting room. Okay, wonderful, great. So welcome to today's Mexican art scene, a virtual studio visit with Raul de Nieves. This is the first in a series of virtual studio visits with contemporary Mexican artists who are making their mark on the international scene today. Inspired by the current exhibition, Border Cantos, Sonic Border, Richard Mizrach, Guillermo Galindo, which is on view at the HRM through May 9th and bears witness to the rich artistic legacy of Mexico that has informed the way we understand the potential of the arts to affect social change. Sculptor, musician, and performance artist Raul Daniels was born in Mexico and has lived in the U.S. since he was nine, currently in New York City. We are privileged this evening to go behind the scenes with the artist to experience how his worlds of fantasy, fashion, and fable converge in colorful beaded creations like those exhibited in the 2017 Whitney Biennial. The artist will be in conversation with Jose Higuera Lopez, director of the Mexican Studies Institute, at the City University of New York, who along with the Lehman College Art Gallery has collaborated in the development of this series with the generous support of Art Bridges. So their conversation and studio visit will be followed by audience Q&A. Please note that your microphones have been muted upon entry and we do ask that you turn off your video. However, we invite you to type your comments and questions in the chat as they occur to you. And uh, at the end of their conversation and studio visit, uh, programs manager Olivia Cipriano will assist in their facilitation. So now, with thanks to Raul Nieves, Jose Higuera Lopez, and my colleagues at the Hudson River Museum, I'd like to turn the program over to Jose, who will tell you more about the artist and accompany us into his world. Thank you, Sarah Linda. Uh, personally, I admire Raul's so, work so much, and I'm very excited to have this conversation with Raul. And I have been following him and admiring his work for now a long time. But before we begin, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Raul, for those of you who don't know him yet. Uh, and then we're going to have a conversation with him, and he's gonna, we're going to have an overview of his work and experience as an artist. Raúl de Nieves was born in 1983 in Michoacán, Mexico, and lives and works in New York City. Raúl works in sculpture and performance, attributes his art practice to his childhood education in Mexico, where he was taught to sew and crochet. Originally planning to enroll in art school in San Francisco, Raúl ultimately changed his mind and decided to study on his own, taking cues from his friends who were enrolled in classes but leaving himself the liberty to follow his own instincts and interests and allowing him to work for several years at the same, on the same pieces. Raul de Nieves makes intricate sculptures using plastic beads that require intensive manual labor. He has gained recognition in both the art and fashion worlds and has often worked in this, uh, with discarded shoes, resulting in pieces that are more fantastical than practical, though still, possible to wear. The expensive, uh, expansive faux stained glass window uh, and beaded sculptures pre he presented at the 2017 Whitney Biennial were among the exhibition's most acclaimed works. Raul, welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my studio. Thank you so much for opening your doors to us, especially during this time of, you know, the pandemic and the whole, just the reality of this and, 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 also adapting to the new reality of, of Zoom visits and everything like right now that we just yeah. had some, some uh, it's part of the show, right? Exactly, so, I'm kind of so used to it. Um, it's funny to feel like a little bit more pressure or that 
these web kind of like live streamings can be a little bit more problematic. But, you know, once you set in, everything is just kind of like, having a conversation with your friend on the phone so exactly that's what we want to 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 see to get into your your space and and i know it's it's very special for you and uh, let's let's jump in so uh how how does your life story and inf has influenced your aesthetic and also what informs your process also as an artist can you start with that well I mean, it's really interesting to think about like these questions and actually, you know, I just um, got to see so much of my work come into um, an exhibition in Miami at MoCA. Um, so for me, it's always been about kind of really realizing myself through the lens of my work um, and also just believing that, you know, there is this kind of idea of a dream. And a dream is actually something that can become a reality. Um, you don't have to dream it, you can actually be it. And, you know, for me, like leaving Mexico, I didn't really know what would happen as my life progressed. But one thing that was really important to me was that connection that I had with my, you know, my Mexican roots. Um, and to kind of maybe try to emulate that in a different format when I came to the United States. But, you know, essentially, like one of the most influential parts of my practice is this idea of, of people, community, um, the music scene, especially. And like, you know, you said, um, I didn't go to school, but I feel like my peers really became um, a huge aspect of what that means to be like uh, taught by someone or to take um, ideas from somebody else and to learn from somebody else's experience and I just really opened up myself to the possibilities of maybe trying to create a relationship with myself and this idea of realizing what it would be or what it would feel like to one day actually be like I'm an artist you know and me being an artist is a form of respect um, I you know it gives me a legacy to think about how to talk about my work and how to also open up my life to people to interpret. Um, because at the end of the day, I want people to kind of interpret the, my objects or you know my performances in their own manner. Um, but it is good to, to kind of give people an understanding that these works really do come from a personal space, um, which is of celebration, celebrating my mother's life, um, the people around me and you know my heritage that's great and and i think uh, it's you can see it right in, in 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 your work the you're you're so creative and and for me i think a question is were you always this creative even when you were little or were you always interested in, in being an artist um i remember like I mean, I, I guess like growing up in Mexico, I didn't really know what artistry would, or like this idea of an artist. I mean, I saw so many people like on the streets, like making work. So to me, it seemed like it was like a very attainable aspect of life, you know, that um, being creative was something that was actually everyone has, you know, but I think obviously as you get older and you start realizing that there is this idea called an art practice um how how you can really enrich in those conversations so um yeah you know i've always been creative i i just actually went to go visit my mom this week and we were like talking and you know it's my family is so proud of of the work that I've done because it really does talk about the legacy of our family in a way and they just really love the celebration that I have with um trying to kind of you know speak about my grandfather or or make works that are related to to the you know the family um but I guess creativity really is something that everyone has and you just kind of have to unlock it to really just feel like it it can enrich your life. And so did you, when you um, immigrated from uh, Michoacan to, to uh, San Diego and then decided to go to San Francisco and later to New York, 
why did you pick San Francisco and New York? I'm, I, I think I, I'm guessing the answer, but can you just share with us just uh, why these two cities are important for you? Well, I definitely San Francisco to me was such a self-realization, um, like, you know, aspect of my life. Like moving to San Francisco meant that I would be maybe closer to more queer people and that it would allow me to feel this like freedom of like actually self-development. Mm -hmm. So San Francisco really became an epicenter of, of me, you know, like the, the fantasy of like being amongst a lot of gay people, um, but the creativity that the city already had through history, through films, um, you know, was something that was so kind of uh, a fantasy. And mm -hmm. I visited San Francisco once before I decided to move there and I fell in love with the city. Um, the energy back, this was like early 2000s was so uh, overwhelming to me, you know, and I was, a 21 year old um, adolescent. So, you know, the aspect of seeing people dressed up or, or more drag queens or this nightlife kind of situation mm -hmm. really was something that I wanted to kind of feel connected to. Um, and I think that's why San Francisco became so kind of uh, groundbreaking for me. Um, it helped me realize myself in so many different ways. And, and obviously, you know, New York City was the ultimate goal. And it was really beautiful to think that me choosing not to go to school gave me this kind of want to understand maybe like the passion of what it meant to be like an artist um, and how I could have realized that without the help of my friends and my community, you know, because essentially at the end of the day, the people around you are the ones that are opening up these opportunities for you, like, you know, the DIY culture, creating these events or, or being able to showcase my art in somebody's like uh, clothing store, you know, and, and opening up this opportunities to, to create this idea of like a, a body of work that could be presented in a public space. That's great. And, and Raul, uh, talking about the process, uh, we can see a little of, of your studio there and we see the beats that you mentioned do you yeah. still remember the first time that you put a bead into some like what was the, the first uh item that you actually started to explore or experiment with beads do you know do you remember yeah actually i mean it's it's really interesting i have like i i mean i should probably like hang this painting like up in a more you know um celebrated way but um, I have this painting that, you know, I was painting on it and I started kind of like gluing toys onto it mm. and the 3D aspect kind of just started to really like embody like this maybe more realized way of making art. Mm. Um, but also like, you know, I've always been that, that type of person that looks at a piece of work and wants to, and I think maybe this is what a lot of artists do or, or people, they want to feel connected to these works where it's almost like how do I bring this into like the 3D world you know like the physical world mm -hmm. so I think maybe the beads really just kind of started to kind of give me that freedom to feel like if I was making a drawing how could I bring this drawing into a reality so maybe drawings did become like sketches for these um, larger bodies of work that I'm doing now but it's interesting now to think of me making so many sculptures um, and using the beads, how like romantically now I wanna go back to like 2D worlds, you know, but I think creating these stained glass facades or any of those things really still allowed me to think about a painterly way of making things. And the beads really do create this kind of, a, I don't know, it's like a fetish, you know, like to see things grow from one molecule to another to understand that accumulation is something really like beautiful and to actually see like the process of time um, through building a sculpture. Um, it, I mean, it's just so romantic to think about those things in my head. And, and you mentioned time and, and I'm curious to know if how much planning goes ahead a time on these uh, pieces and, and also, uh, do you have a sense of the end product when you're planning or do you just 
led creation, I, you know? I think I just, I mean, you know, it's with the, like when I was making the shoes or when I'm making a pair of shoes, like, you know, there's already a, like a fundamental structure to this work. Um, so there's, there's not necessarily like a vision other than like a desire to kind of like grow from each artwork to film artwork. Um, you know, I mean, it's really interesting because even when I'm like planning to do these like large scale window projects, mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh, you must sketch this before. But I treat it almost like, you know, as you would treat like, a, I guess like, a, you know, when you're making a movie, you have to kind of like outline things. Um, but I try not to be too um, attached to one thing being this way. And I think that's like the beauty of the work that it's transforming so much as I'm making something. Mm -hmm. So that's like kind of the best aspect that my work can give me that it's so much about interpretation and spontaneity that it kind of feels very fresh. You know, it's my work can be looked at and thought of as repetitive, but actually there's, I don't feel like it has a very repetitive notion other than the fact that I, yes, I'm either doing this with my fingers or, or sewing with my hands, but because it's constantly changing, I see it as like a form of freedom, you know, to really just allow for like, anything to happen and you know I think looking back at the work that I've made in you know the past 15 years and going to Mocha and seeing these pieces um like Daves of Wonder this this sculpture that took me seven years you know and mm -hmm. and what that meant was I really working on it for seven years straight yes but it wasn't like every day but each day there was a different kind of challenge to how to make this work you know and mm -hmm. to see that I think that was like the most beautiful thing that sculpture has taught me that it has this endurance of patience you know and um and that you can come across the idea of failure being a part of the practice you know to see something not necessarily work and whether you are to stop or do you continue to believe in it and give it more more life in that sense um so i think yeah like you know going back and thinking about time it's time is something really beautiful to think about and you know to build these relationships with these works that you can have a legacy of like thinking this took me seven years or this thing took me three days you know like the the different feelings of what that is is something really like beautiful mm -hmm. and well I, I i know that some of our viewers are getting anxious they want to see your studio so okay. as i ask you a little uh, a little bit more about your work can you just show us around and, and yeah let me flip yes. the camera so um and again keep talking as you're showing uh, if you're is, showing your studio so, yeah. yeah this is my studio like here's like you know boxes of beat i just ordered a bunch of beads so they just came in um it's really cool they come in like these really small bags but i try to be organized somehow you know because i do have a lot of material um oh this is the, the painting that i was telling you with the oh, like okay. this is the first yeah, uh, but uh i have a pretty you know the studio's not so big but it's not so small either and i mean i just moved to the studio last year in, in february um so actually moving into the space with these beautiful windows you know like my my previous studios were in these diy community spaces that weren't necessarily like a traditional studio so this is like a traditional studio in the sense that there's mm -hmm. all the great great doors um but these works that i'm working well they're right here right now are the works that i've made in this studio and the process of actually having more space has allowed me to really be a little bit more like ambitious with the sculpture practice mm -hmm. um these these three works of so this one um this horse figure like mm -hmm. And then this um, standing figure were are all being picked up on Friday. Um, if you if anyone of you live in New York City, you will be able to, to see these at the High Line, um, which right. is such an amazing um, thing to realize to actually see these things go outside and sit out in the in the weather. Um, but it's it's kind of amazing, you know. Um, can, and can I have I, let me jump in while you were showing the sculptures. I want I have a question. So I remember, uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong. So you started doing also wearable sculptures and your performances and everything 
was it a challenge to create then to to jump to uh, freestanding sculptures like the, the ones we we're seeing um well see here's like a pair of shoes right now that i actually just made for um this art fair happening in um uh, in paris right now called mm. fiac um but you know like i think it was like this i i love apparel you know and um like the fantasy that apparel gives us also is really interesting to me that like you can put something on and it like completely changes your mood. Um, so in a way, like, I think that's why like uh, the sculpture practice did become this thing that I wanted to kind of like be a little bit more fantastical with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and like thinking about treating like a shoe as like a form of sculpture um, and, and having like, you know, a functioning aspect to being able to put this on and then have it turn into like an object, you know, like, I think that was really cool for me to realize. Um, but also, you know, like I said, growing up and seeing um, performers, you know, put on costumes and, and kind of like what, how it changes you when you put something on to perform and um, what that kind of felt. And I don't know, I mean, here I have this like, really beautiful Mexican like embroidery and you know it's like mm -hmm. these uh, these objects are really special to me because to me it's like it's like a living work of art you know that actually can travel with you um but things like this are what kind of like change my aspect of like you know wanting to kind of um use these traditions in my in my um curriculum and like to try to kind of learn from the things that I was growing up seeing and, and Raul feel free to sit down and, yeah. and just to, to continue the conversation I think thank you for sharing the space um, we have seen well I, I I've noticed uh, within your work there's some constant constant elements you know um, some say it's almost like a religious influence I see it more like a sense of sacredness and 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 symbolism a lot of symbolism especially with the uh, stained glass and also mm -hmm. to talk about the material that you use uh, sometimes it's too heavy, uh, the glass. Why did you pick these uh, plastic, uh, colored plastic, right? Uh, and and there's some elements you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you have this conversation also with your uh, with your creations about family and some mm -hmm. some uh, so, some family members. I think are are also woven into your stories and your mm -hmm. uh, and also I've seen a fly uh, as a constant yeah. in your work. Can you talk about this? Well, I think, you know, actually, I was also just talking to a friend and um, and I think the the beauty of kind of like finding inspiration is to look at symbolism, you know, in the way that life has been a, a form of a symbol and that there is all these symbols around us that can create this uh, immediate reaction to what they kind of should mean or or that there is a meaning behind everything. You know, the fly actually was to me a celebration of of a humbleness, you know, to think about the fly as annoyance, but also maybe of a warning sign, um, or just also like, you know, um, it's something that for me, I think I just, I was like really, I had the studio um, with a little backyard and there was this mulberry tree that would drop mulberries every summer. And they would kind of like, uh, rot on the on the, at the floor and I would start seeing these flies go and like drink the juice of this fermented berry mm -hmm. um and then they would like fly into my studio and they would like not go away and I I kind of like can kill a fly so I was like really like ah this stupid fly won't go away and then when I saw that it was like drunk I think it was drunk you know like it would have <laughs> been sipping on this like fermented berry it's like when I started to realize how beautiful this like creature um you know aspect of life was and it just reminded me of like my vulnerable self so it, it actually kind of like you know thinking about a fly as a romantic kind of um aspect of life it just also allowed, it started to allow me to see that there is so many ways symbolism through picture making or or representation have been you know introduced through different uh, aspects of life and uh, the fly really just became something beautiful to me to actually present once again as like a form of an artwork um, because in a way you know putting a fly in a stained glass window it's a little bit like 
esoteric, but then it, I think, allows for people to think about why is this fly in all of these artworks and what does it mean and what does it mean to me? Um, but personally, to me, it just, it, it really resembled this humility of life, you know, like the fragility of things mm -hmm. and how I was also creating these works with like, maybe like fragile looking um, materials, but how they were so sturdy in a sense. Um, so I think it really just like the marriage of all of that really was like really beautiful. That's great, thank you. And 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 for the people that are joining us, we are getting close to the Q and A uh, portion of the program. And I would encourage everyone to type their questions in the chat box. And uh, I will do my best to read all of them, but also tell us and share with us, where are you actually joining us from? And I will also uh, just read your comments to Raul, okay? So Raul, uh, also um, you mentioned um, about your passion for music and performance. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been able to see one of your performances with Somos Monstros and uh, it's, it's just, for me, it's just such beauty to see in the creativity. It, it, you cannot deny the creativity that you have. And, and just, can you talk, when did you start exploring or experimenting with music and performance and how does uh, mixing these three, you know, performance, music as a musician, and art, uh, really inform your 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 artwork, your body of work? Well, definitely. I mean, moving to San Diego, you know, like after leaving Mexico, there came a point where I was like, I need to find a community, and the music, um, the music community, like this underground music scene, was the first thing that actually allowed me to feel like I was a part of something. Um, or that I could create, um, you know, it, it was the first time also that I felt like uh, the idea of commanding space could be something really um, inviting also, you know, to, to let people um, for one 30 minutes, you becoming like their center of attention um, was really amazing. But I think the raw energy of music and live performances was something that really just spoke to me, you know? and how it would bring all these people together and you would become part of a scene, you know, like a music scene or a, a specific genre. Um, so, you know, growing up and seeing bands was such a like enriching part of my practice because it, it really did open up a whole new psyche in my brain, you know? And um, I think performance um, really allows for people to, to really fully speak about themselves in a, maybe like in this like you know abstract way mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's it's it shows in your pieces uh they they seem alive they seem almost like they're moving they're they're so expressive for, uh, i'm going to start reading some of the questions and comments uh danielle says i love beadwork romantic andrea says i love your work and the freedom and the vitality that it has can you tell us more about your your choice of materials for the pieces yeah the static and the performing ones performance ones mm -hmm. okay well i mean i think material wise like obviously i've stuck to like the beat is like a, a main aspect of my of my practice but um you know thinking about like the things that are around me i think that's when i when i when i start to see that there's an accumulation of this same kind of um material is when I start to kind of romanticize about like, you know, cutting up like 500 postcards to make a, a painting or, you know, um, like the acetates, you know, how like uh, they just became so like easy to kind of like reimagine. And I think taking an object or, or a material and having it become something maybe that it's not supposed to be like that was, um, I think kind of like the ultimate freedom of using these things that are around us and to give them a new kind of like, it's like polishing a rock, you know, and being like, mm -hmm. this rock might not be a diamond, but I could make it look like a diamond, you know? Mm -hmm. and they're also asking, and, and uh, did, I, you didn't see the questions because you were using your phone, uh, mm -hmm. but when you were showing um, the sculptures and also the shoes, they're asking, uh, well, Daniel asks, are they made of resin or is it only the beads that you uh, start adding um, that actually make? 
Well, yeah, these new ones, the ones from mm -hmm. the Highline are like resin. So there's like a beautiful, like you kind of can't sell, tell, but um, we use this, um, the resin that they would use to make surfboards um, okay. so that they can sustain the, 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 weather. the weather. But um, yeah, most of the beaded works are resined. Um, this is like, I mean, it's so interesting to see that there's like, this is one that's not resin yet. Um, but, you know, I started resonating these pieces because I do want them to have a legacy or to sustain time. You know, these materials, I don't, I'm not really sure. Well, it's, it's, a, it's plastic. So I don't know how, like, how this would disappear in, in, in the reality of the world. Like, um, how plastic is something really kind of like man-made that probably lasts forever, but, um, I do resin the works and um, depending on, on what it is. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and also um, they're saying that it's going to be amazing. Laura says it's amazing. It's going to be out, outdoors and to be able to see it outdoors, it's going to be great. And the High Line, uh, they say that's great. Also, what, you know, when is going to be actually able to, to go and see this work in the High Line? Do you have a date? Well, so the works will be installed um, this month. Mm. So once they're installed, they're just publicly open. You know, there's every year they have a, a group show on the High Line. And these works actually were supposed to be presented last year on the High Line. But because of pandemic, mm -hmm. everything just got pushed to this year, which is actually like such a silver lining to think about like what pandemic kind of like allowed us also to reflect upon and that these opportunities, um, you know, like to feel the, the desire to, to showcase again. Um, but it's gonna be really interesting to see these works out in front of people, you know, that they can actually sit next to it and interact with it, touch it. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm really, really curious to see how people react to them, but also how the work reacts to being as a public artwork you know this is kind of like a fantasy of mine uh that I've always been like you know people are like say the things you want because somehow they you kind of start manifesting and people would always ask me like what's your wildest dream and I would be like to have a public art piece you know and now I'm like to see these things actually turn into that reality I mean I think that's why also like um following these like you know goals or or thinking about uh, something that could be attained um, and making it realized. It's what I'm saying. It's like, there's the beauty of dreaming, but also like waking up and making things real. That's great. That's beautiful. Uh, Eileen uh, comments, uh, she so appreciates your work and creativity, and she's looking forward to seeing your sculptures in the High Line. And also you have transformed my feelings about flies there is now a new beauty that I see. That's great. Yay! I know we gotta find beauty and like, you know, I think sometimes that's the thing. It's like, I feel like when we think about fear and we start to realize that fear is something that can actually also be defeated or things that kind of like make us uncomfortable. Um, I think it's when you start seeing like how beautiful everything around us is, you know? Even like chaos can sometimes be like, beautiful because it makes you want to create more structure um mm -hmm. yes and and melissa castillo planas asks i think you answered this question already uh, earlier but maybe not you can actually add to it but is where would be your dream place to have your work presented and why indoors versus outdoors and how does it, that change the presentation and experience of the curation um I definitely, I mean, a, a, I think a dream is to have like a big proper show in Mexico. Um, you know, like, I feel like it would be so beautiful to, you know, I've, I've had several exhibitions in Mexico, but um, I mean, I think making a show at a museum like El Tamayo or, you know, that would be so beautiful because these were places that we visited as kids, so. Mm -hmm um you know the relationship is is something that I'm like oh my god but you know we're talking about it now so who knows who, who knows happen. who's listening 
exactly. know, like I'm gonna send my flies over to, <laughs> to these like institutions <laughs> to be like, we want this now. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen. I I, I can yeah. definitely see uh, your work also, uh, especially so uh, for me. I think it's so um, s powerful that, uh, especially uh, right now that you're talking to us under the frame of this work in the in the Hudson River Museum about talking about migration and everything and how you as an artist that came from Mexico but now lives in, in the States, it would be so powerful to, for you to go back uh, to, to Mexico and show, it's, it's gonna be incredible. And I think yeah, it's, exactly. it's gonna be incredible because it's gonna happen, I, I'm sure of it. Yeah. So um, I have here also uh, Mayra Rodriguez, uh, mm -mm. what other, other ins insects do you like and have you done with them in term of art? Um, I mean, I kind of really started like, I, you know, speaking of migration and kind of transformation, like I started, I mean, I, I'm very attracted to, you know, butterflies because also they, you know, they migrate to Mexico, Michoacan, where I'm from, but mm -hmm. I, I've been, I've been kind of like romanticizing about frogs a lot and also thinking about their patterns of how they go from a tadpole to this like realized, like being you know and how they 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 go from water to land and and that they find these like populations where um like you know things are clean and stuff but like i really love frogs and also the symbolism of frogs you know that they they are these mystical creatures like thinking about like the the you know kissing a frog and it turns into a prince you know like this mm -hmm. these beautiful romantic um stories that already exist um but I'm pretty much like I'm a, I'm an animal kind of person. I don't have an animal, but I'm planning on getting a dog uh, soon. I think maybe in <laughs> June. Um, but yeah, I love horses too. Like horses are beautiful, right? Yeah. Here's this is like a giant. Look at this giant horse. This is that I'm gonna ask you about that. Is this from the carousel or no? Is this this is another piece. It's like a life-size freestanding horse that I'm working on for this show that will happen later this year. Um, but I like the idea of like animals and humans, you know, kind of like transforming into one. Mm. Um, yeah, that's great. There's another comment from Laura. Let me see. The, the, she loves the quality of light and the beats that they provide is magical. Uh, Stefan says, is any of the plastic sourced from recycled re sources, uh, the ones that you use? Yeah, actually, you know, pre-pandemic, um, there was this amazing facility here in New York City called Materials for the Arts. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but it's, it's like a warehouse where a lot of, you know, foundations will donate like recyclable materials mm -hmm. that are, you know, fabrics and, um, you know, I, I tend to use like things that like, you know, use clothing or, or things that can be, you know, I do buy like new beads, um, but since I've become like kind of known as like the bead artist, like actually people end up donating a lot of beads to me because people hate beads. <laughs> you know, they're like, they're like, what am I gonna do with the stupid bead? Um, so they think, oh, that guy who makes the beaded artworks, like let's contact him. And so if anyone wants to donate beads, we can obviously send them my way. But um, yeah, you know, I love using cardboard. Like I think cardboard is such a like lost material that people don't think about a lot. Um, but you know, like papers and whatever, yeah. And there's a question like also in the, in the process, I see that the horse that you just showed us, is it, so what's the structure? Is the structure cardboard? Is it is it resin or is it just beads, like freestanding beads? Mm -hmm. Like well, you know, like I used to when I started making the beaded works, they were solid beads. I don't know how I was so crazy to just like come up with these structures just like purely made out of beads. And I think they they took me so long. Um, but now I have been using um like fiberglass. So like the the horse mm -hmm. is a fiberglass um structure. Um I tend to use mannequins a lot too, like cut up mannequins and reconfigure them. Um, but I, you know, I I love I love to find something that can really influence me. You know, like like just the simplicity of a shoe. How like that structure just kind of allowed me to really go wild and have a form of creativity 
like blossom through through things that we kind of can recognize. And to, to that point, to, to the shoes and, and, and just clothing, can you talk about the uh, collaborations or uh, with with uh, fashion, you know, or can you talk about uh, your, your experience doing this and how it came to be? Um, well, I mean, I think it, it, it all started because I was making these fantasy shoes, you know, and um, when I, I, like these um, stylists started asking to borrow the works, um, which I found that it was the best kind of like form of um, starting a conversation with something that I truly adored, which was fashion. Um, but that the shoe started making these appearances and like these editorials, that's kind of maybe where the beginning of these relationships started. But, you know, I've collaborated with Tiffany, uh, Bulgari, Hermes, um, Swarovski. Uh, it, it's kind of just so beautiful to, to think that these companies really do uh, also appreciate the arts and that they, they do want to be feel connected to maybe what's happening and feel like, um, you know, having a collaboration with like an outsider artist, or I don't know if I should say outsider, but um, that it is kind of a new way of making things, you know, like, I've always been uh, very attracted to jewelry. So when I got to collaborate with Tiffany, it was a dream come true. Um, and same with Bulgari, you know, they helped me make this carousel. They like funded my carousel project. Um, but it really was kind of, I didn't realize how easy it could be. You know what I mean? It's also like this thing that I had no idea of how to, but just me wanting, like, you know, when you when someone asks you like, uh, like what is it that you want to do and I was like I want to make a carousel and then all of a sudden you're like oh my god I actually have to do this and these people are gonna help me I think that's when like I really kind of get scared because I'm like how am I gonna pull this through but I think realizing that there's always um, a form of um, partnership is kind of beautiful mm -hmm. you know and this carousel itself what um, house was it is it uh, was it uh, collaboration with 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 what artist or I'm sorry with what fashion brand? Uh, Bulgari. Okay, and did you do it by yourself or did you actually have some assistance that you this guided was, through the process? This because was I the first time I had assistance. Um, we worked on the carousel for about three to four months. We found like a 1950s like defunct carousel and just refurbished the whole entire exterior and um, rethought, reconfigured these characters that would go onto the carousel. But um, yeah, like, you know, th this, this collaboration with Bulgari just came out of like them also wanting to fund the arts um, and give an artist an opportunity to, to see where that marriage, how that marriage would, would work out. That's great. And, and, and so you're, you're right now working on this project for, for the Highline, I think it's almost done, or is it done already? Uh, and and what, what other projects are you starting right now, if you want to share with us before we actually leave? Um, well, I'm currently um, trying to make more music with my band, um, because we really miss performing, but um, I have a show this fall at the ICA Boston, um, where I'll be showing new, um, brand new like sculptures and, mm -hmm. and also this kind of like large um, map looking um, collage. Uh, but, you know, I'm always, I'm one of these artists that loves to just come to the studio and because my work does take a lot of time. So there's always something kind of like in the making. Um, and sometimes things don't really necessarily need to have a purpose or where they're going, because I think that's, like the beauty of actually making work is when it's actually for you, um, you know, when you're just doing it to realize an idea, but it is cool. I'm really excited about the show in Boston um, because I think me and the curator have gotten to become really close friends. And, you know, we're like, um, I proposed a question to both of us and maybe this is something that we can um, leave off of, but, you know, I, I said to myself, like, who would I be without my memories? You know, like, what, what, what kind of person would I be if, if everything that was like, 
registered in my mind disappeared. And I think it's, it's, it's a really beautiful thing to think about, you know, even right now thinking about like pandemic and how the world was different just a year ago and how much is changing and, and what that means to each person. Mm -hmm. There's two more questions here. Uh, one from David Grande, he has a, a preface with a, with a story, like a personal story with, with his uh, partner and about uh, just going and having the, 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 the benefit of going to Mexico City and visiting uh, as locals, uh, the different art scenes and, and, and mm -hmm. museums. But the question at the end is, um, where did you feel like you were able to peak with your art form in regards to connections you made in artistic work? And what cities, of the, of the major cities you were living in? Well, I think definitely like New York made me realize kind of, it, it helped realize a lot of things. Um, obviously the Whitney Biennial helped me really just flourish, you know, and it was really beautiful to kind of build these relationships also with curators and, and to kind of help them interpret your work as well. You know, I, when they asked me to make, cause they asked me, they were like, do you think you could make this? Like, they were like, you know, we were standing in front of the windows and they were like, this is where we think your art should be. And I was like, where and they're like on the window you know and I was like ah like I was like oh my god I was like I want to say no but I'm gonna say yes you know so I think um these moments have really kind of also allowed me to realize that I'm still learning you know and that um there's still so much growth to happen but these these very like special times in our lives like I'll always look back to um that that moment when I got to exhibit my work at the Whitney and how taking on a challenge almost you know like they were like we challenge you to make this window and I'm like okay you know and realizing that it could be possible like mm -hmm. those moments are kind of the most beautiful treasures that's great and I'm just going to close with this uh question that actually I think we go full circle uh, Minya is asking the beats and the colors remind her of uh, the Huichol art uh, mm -hmm. tech or technique. Is it something in that inspires you uh, there? Of course. I mean, you know, I, I remember being a kid and seeing the Huicholas like, and they were dressed so beautiful. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, the family was like, those are the mystics, those are like, you know, the magicians of, of life, you know, and that they were making these beautiful, small, intricate, beaded artworks on the street, you know, you can see them doing it. It's just like the meditative process was something really that stuck to me. And I think also their presence, you know, like that they were so costumed or that I don't want to say costume, but their, their clothing was so special and it had so much meaning to who they were and how they would be seen and, um, in a society, I think mm. they really just help change my um, my perception of of how I view the world. You know, that's that's great, uh, Raúl. Thank you so much for opening the doors you. of your studio and pleasure. taking this time to share with us uh, the process and your experience and and a little of you. And I invite everyone to follow Raúl if you're not already doing. Uh, follow him on social media. What's your social media, uh, Raúl? Uh, uh, no, Raúl. No raw rules, like no rules, but just my name. <laughs> oh, great. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Sarah Linda from the Hudson River Museum. But thank you so much again, Raul. Thank, thank you, guys. Um, my goodness. Thank you so much, Raul. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. What an amazing conversation. And there's so much. I mean, you've opened up so much. Just thinking about the symbolism and the magic of the accretion, I'm just thinking about the accretion of the beads and how you build them and how they they represent, you know, the materials just represent time and, and layers of experience. And, and as you said, of memory, um, they, are, they are alive. And uh, I really thank you so, so much, Raul. Um, and, and I do wanna mention um, that there are a few more artists who are going to be uh, part of this series and um, they will be listed in, in our uh, calendar, but on March 24th, we'll be visiting with Andrea Arroyo, uh, also born in Mexico and working in New York City. Uh, so that will also be uh, at seven o'clock on, on a Wednesday evening. 
as will our visit with the Javier Marin Foundation and the Fabrica San Pedro directly from Mexico on April 7th. Uh, so we do hope everyone will join us for those sessions. And also just coming up this weekend, we have two um, wonderful programs inspired by Border Canto's Sonic Border. Uh, Saturday at two o'clock, we have a virtual artist talk with Erica Harsh, who is the teaching artist in residence uh, for that exhibition. And she also just, Raul, so you know, she is inspired by the monarch butterfly and oh, um, you know the metaphor of uh, migration and metamorphosis transformation mm -hmm. so we're kind of building on this theme thank you for opening <laughs> opening it up sure. and um and then on Sunday, we have a virtual tour of the exhibition, Boracanto Sonic Border, with our curator, Laura Vogels. Um, so once again, um, I wanna thank everybody for being here with us this evening. Thank you for your patience, for your engagement, for your fabulous questions and comments. And um, Ro, I just can't wait. I, I, I've got to go visit the Highline. I mean, yeah, I know, right? I know, can't it, wait. It, it, you know, you've like opened the doors to spring. Yay, I know, Yay. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. So Thank, you. Much, Thank you, guys. And yes, to everybody, be well. Yeah, lots of love. Thank Spread you. Spread the love. Yeah. Thank you, Raul. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great evening.